All right. Um, are we all ready? Yeah. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, we are Earthrise Space. We are a company building lunar landers for the Google Lunar X Prize, and we would like to introduce SwampWorks. We are very excited to have with us today. Uh, do you guys want to talk about SwampWorks real quick? Let's kind of explain what you do. Okay, sure. Um, sw SwampWorks, it's uh, our KSC, uh, Kennedy Space Center Innovation Lab, essentially. Our, our purpose is uh, harvesting space resources. So we, we develop innovative we'd like to think game-changing technologies in support of NASA mission architectures and emerging commercial space uh, companies. That's that's us in a nutshell. All right, awesome. Um, so we've got a couple questions listed out here. I know you guys are busy and have about an hour. We'll try and get through as many as we can. And if other people join, then we can get questions and answers at the end. Um, first question is, why the moon? Why, are, why is NASA focused on the moon right now? There's a lot of talk of going to Mars and a lot of talk of people setting up a base on the moon as a stepping stone to Mars. Uh, what, what's your opinion on all this? Well, officially NASA is, NASA's mission is to go to an asteroid. And for our lab, that's a surface, and we're, we're prepared to go to any surface, and there's a lot of overlaps in the technologies. So commercial space is thinking moon, and we're supporting them, and NASA's thinking asteroids and Mars, and we're supporting them too. Phil, you got any, anything to add? I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Jack and I are actually in the same room, and yeah, I'm so looking I have the mute line. I'm going to show you. There's Jack. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> So there's Jack behind me up on the platform, but we're in the uh, Swamp Works live right now. So um, NASA is doing a robotic mission to the moon where we're going to prospect for ice, and the mission is called the Resource Prospector Mission. So NASA is very interested in the resources of the moon, and there are lunar scientists studying the moon. We're launching a mission to the moon very soon. It'll be orbiting the moon, studying the environment. Uh, I mean, excuse me, studying the atmosphere and the dust environment of the moon. It's called the LADEE mission. So there are things NASA is doing focused on the moon. For human exploration, though, we are moving towards a asteroid mission as rapidly as possible by landings on Mars. And the technologies, like Jack said, for the moon, for asteroids for Mars have a lot of overlap. And so the technologies that we're developing to support these activities can be applied across the solar system. They can also be, be used by commercial space if anybody wants to adopt these technologies to um, use in their commercial mission. And so we're excited about that collaboration as well. Awesome. All right. Uh, what resources in, particularly, in, in particular are you looking for on the surface of the moon and asteroids? Why don't you uh, tell us who the question is towards each time? Uh, Phil. Okay. <laughs> okay, so for resources on the moon, there's uh, the lunar soil is an obvious resource. It's got a lot of metal in the soil. There is uh, silicate material that you could use for making ceramics and such. But the big one that everybody's excited about right now is the ice. We know because of modeling and because of theory, and also now because of the impact of the Elcross spacecraft into the pole of the moon, that there is a lot of water ice frozen into the permanently shattered craters. And it's not just water ice, it's also carbon dioxide and other carbon compounds, and it's um, ammonia compounds. So there is everything we need on the moon to do industry in space. We can use the carbon and the water from the ice to make methane, which is a very storable propellant for rockets. And we could use the, the carbon for making plastics or rubber. We could use the ammonia, maybe, for growing plants, make it into a, a nitrogen compound for grow by plants. I want to mute for a minute because we have a safety weapon. 
Okay, sorry about that. We had to mute the microphones because there was a weather announcement going on. Florida weather. Okay, so, so uh, for the moon, those are some of the resources. Of course, there's sunlight and even vacuum is a resource, depending if you're doing an industrial process that wants a vacuum, then the moon's a great place for that. Also, if you're looking for somewhere that's very, very cold, then the permanently shadow craters are good. So that's a resource as well. People have even talked about putting gigantic computing facilities in the permanently shadowed craters of the moon in order to do quantum computing on a very large scale. So who knows what we're going to be doing in the future on the moon. There's all kinds of opportunities. Awesome. Um, so right now we're, you, or you, you're developing technologies to move regolith and to start the robotic mining operations? That's true. Yeah. Let me, um, I'm going to walk with this computer over and I'm going to show you a robot that was built recently that does mining in low gravity environments. This is Razor. Razor is a low gravity space mining robot. And it's got a couple of, um, let's see if I can hold the computer better. So here we've got, this is really awkward. <laughs> this is a oh, drone great. that rotates to do digging and there's a drum on each end of Razor. So here's one over here too. And uh, Razor weighs less than 100 kilograms. And so on the moon, it's going to weigh something like 16 kilograms, actually less than that. And so the most uh, force, I'm going to use English units for force, the most force you can use for digging is about 15 pounds with a vehicle that size. But Razor has buckets that spin opposite directions so that all the digging forces cancel out so that you can do mining with a very low mass vehicle in a low gravity environment. So uh, that's one example of space mining technologies that are currently being built, uh, developed here in the Swamp Works. Awesome. Uh, Jack, do you have anything to add to that? Okay. Sure. Um, I'm up in the technology incubator area and one of the things we're doing with Regolith is using it as a feedstock for a 3D printer. So I'll, I'll do our vision here. That uh, so our our vision is to use the regolith as feedstock to make landing pads, habitats for radiation protection, making uh, return heat shield heat shields out, out of the regolith and we're working with the University of Southern California on that and what we're doing over here is this is a printer head that that uses regolith and we're uh, working on mixing different kinds of polymers with it to bind Oop, did I lose signal? Oh, what happened there? Is this Are we still on? Huh, yeah. That was weird. Interesting. Um, so, then down here you can see some of our early examples of uh, we're trying to print structures with regolith and, and polymer binders. Now that's that's mostly a pulverized basalt. Right. Phil, you want to run with that one? Sure. So the regolith on the moon or Mars or an asteroid is ground up. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, it's a ground up rock, and on the moon and uh, other airless locations, it's very finely ground up because of the lack of geological processes to to um, to re cement it together. Right. So on the um, on the moon, it's a very fine powder. And there, there are not any clay minerals on the moon, so we're trying to find out what can we use for a binder to make a, something to replace concrete. We're looking at just simply melting the material using microwaves, using lasers, 
and other methods. There's been quite a bit of work in microwaving it. I can show you over here. These are some landing pad coupons that we were using. We um, microwaved some simulated lunar soil, and that's right here. This is microwaved simulated lunar soil. Um, and then we've also added polymers to simulated lunar soil. And we've taken them out to a launch pad, and somebody flew a rocket on it for us. That's Mast and Space Systems did that out at their launch pad. And um, you see it's a little bit darker <laughs> because of the yeah. rocket exhaust. But the microwaved lunar soil behaves really well. And uh, it's kind of hard to microwave with a good uh, control in the process to get a, an even center. So we're trying to advance that technology. We're looking at additional methods I mentioned, lasers. We're also um, using our convective methods to do the centering. So, awesome. Um, Jack is standing up near the hardware that does uh, that technology development right now. So how big are the 3D printers that you would want to use to print what, whatever it is that you need printed? Well, we aren't working on the packaging yet. Ideally, it would be tiny. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Next to nothing. So right now, we're not really working on packaging. We're just re working on the processes of how do you bind a soil without any sort of a uh, cement to do yeah. the bind. Jack, you've got something you want to show? Well, we've got uh, the brick making device that we took to Mauna Kea, which is a dormant volcano on the big island of Hawaii. And this is a, a brick we made out of the volcanic ash using some polymer binder. And uh, we, we hope to work on that further. Very cool. Very cool. So, optimally, would these printers and um, would this machinery be set up by robots or by people? I think you're muted. Muted. So we're developing the technologies to work robotically with as much autonomy as possible because they have to go out and they have to do the work before humans arrive. If you right. want to build a landing pad on Mars, because the vehicle is so large that it needs a landing pad, then by definition you've got to send a small vehicle first, one that's robotic, to build that landing pad. And we're trying to put as much autonomy into the robotics as we can because between Earth and Mars round trip there's a time delay that varies seasonally between 12 and 40, um, excuse me, yeah, about 12 and 40 minutes round trip. And so, um, Sorry, I think it's 24 and 40 minutes round trip. So it's too long of a time delay to operate the equipment with a joystick. So yeah. the robotics has to be autonomous. It has to be able to make simple decisions and handle construction and small manufacturing tasks by itself. All right. Awesome. Um, before we go on, uh, Todd, do you have any questions that you wanted to ask? It seems like it's... Just us right now. No, thanks. I just wanted to, uh, you know, I joined in because I'm a, a coordinator of a Race to the Top uh, grant for STEM education. I run an online school in southwest Colorado, but I help coordinate the grant for nine rural districts. So one of the things I'm doing is one learning. I'm a science teacher by training, uh, but I just wanted to uh, hear what everybody had to say and start expanding our, our networks and opportunities for students to use online avenues like this to learn about uh, careers in STEM education. So I'm just looking for some contacts. I hope you don't mind if I uh, add you all to my circle and uh, keep in touch because this is pretty amazing. Everybody should be able to see this, particularly in rural Colorado where we just run a bunch of agriculture machinery <laughs> and ski. So uh, thanks for having me. No problem. You know, it's it's interesting. I've I've done a couple of these um, a couple of these hangouts so far. One was with Elon Musk and Richard Branson, and that that was an awesome one. There was lots of good information and a couple other NASA hangouts. And I think this is a really great avenue to uh, to meet face to face with people. Um, on the subject of students, well, there you go. From Jan, um, what 
what direction should students start to work if they want to get into a into the space industry, especially for the space industry in six to ten years? Once SLS is up and running, hopefully. Well, I would say to first of all focus on your science classes, your math classes, really try to excel in those areas. But also communications is really important for doing engineering and doing science. So pretty much everything you learn in school is important. Uh, I would like to encourage you though to, to especially try hard to excel in math. When you get into university you might want to pursue a science degree. There's planetary scientists, physicists, and other branches of science in space. This morning, Jack was leading a tour group that I think was astrobiology students. Uh, you might want to pursue a degree in engineering. You work with mechanical engineers, electrical, aerospace, chemical engineers. Pretty much all the branches of engineering are involved. We do working with soil on other planets, and so we like to work also with civil engineers. Civil meaning cities. We want to move civilization into space. I, uh, so, uh, all the branches of engineering are needed. Jack, yeah. do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, and you know what I what I would like to add to that is uh, it's an it's an emerging industry, so you you need business people, accounting people. You can be enthusiastic about space and maybe not excel at math and science, but we need uh, space law experts and anything that an industry would need uh, you need the complete skill set to, to be able to to make the, the future happen right so we there's a there's a lot of ways that are tried and true with engineering and other stem fields to get into the space industry but for people working towards business degrees or accounting degrees because I've heard this from many many people that that's one of the things that's going to be uh, more and more in demand. What would you say the best option is to start working in the space industry with those degrees? Well, um, where, where can you start? You know, I, I kind of would say it's such a new industry. Getting into the technical side of it is, as a technical base is probably really important since it's such a new thing. You do need to understand the industry from a technical standpoint. So I would go back to what Phil said, the basic engineerings and uh, sciences related to that, including the life sciences um, for, for right now, because there's not really a whole lot of jobs yet in uh, the different kind of business fields. And let me, let me add another thought to that. So in addition to the schoolwork, a really important, even I'd say critical part of your education is gaining real world experience and through that networking with other people that are already involved in space. So a student could do that by being involved in a robotics club, for example. The first robotics in high school is a good program for learning robotics and learning technologies that are relevant and networking with people that are interested and involved in space. Then there are some clubs. There's the National Space Society, which has chapters all around the country. And if there's not a local chapter in your area, then be the person that starts one. And that will be a great way to meet a lot of people and to jumpstart a career in space. There's also, for college students, the SEDS. Students for the Exploration and Development of Space. And again, if your college doesn't have one, start a chapter. And by being the, go, the kind of person that goes for it and starts the chapter, you're already distinguishing yourself as the right kind of person that is going to make a difference in the industry. So be proactive and make these opportunities. I think uh, also internships is really important. Go to the NASA website, look for internship opportunities. If you can't get an internship with NASA, you could get one with a commercial space company, or you could get one doing some other area that's relevant to the space industry. Right. So uh, those, I think, are just as important as the education you get in school. OK. Um, Ruben, our CEO, has joined us. Uh, Ruben, do you want to introduce yourself, or do you have audio? Yeah, yeah uh, it was on mute by default, apparently, because of the amount of people on Google+. Plus, but. 
Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ruben. I'm the president and CEO of Earthrise hello, Space Foundation. Um, and we're a company dedicated to provide students with hands-on experience building spacecraft. Uh, and we've been doing this since 2008. Uh, we have a facility near UCF where where we provide students with internships and we link them up with uh, engineers that are here full time and and throughout the past few years they've been developing subsystems and and other general components. I don't know if Daniel can hear me or not. <laughs> Hey, Daniel. So I could hear Ruben fine while he was talking. Yeah. That's interesting. I couldn't hear or see him. Bizarre. It's funny how it works with uh, with communications right here on Earth, but it's <laughs> communicating with spacecraft in outer space sometimes, you know. <laughs> Seems to work just fine. Seems like other people are starting to, to write on the chat window saying that they could have they could hear me fine as well. Mm -hmm. Daniel? I'm going to go join Daniel in the other room. <laughs> OK. <laughs> that was interesting. So what did Ruben say? <laughs> I, I couldn't hear or see him on my screen. I don't know why. He's coming here. Oh, OK, OK. Huh. So um, you were you were mentioning SEDS. It's funny. Um, I'm actually going to a SEDS meeting right after this. I'm president of the local chapter of SEDS at UCF, and that's where I got a lot of the connections that I've got right now. Is uh, just been doing that kind of thing. Very cool. Another thing that college aid students might consider, or even early career people might consider, is International Space University. That's an outstanding program that can jumpstart your career in space. I'd like to introduce somebody to you. Uh, Rob Mueller just walked up. I'm just going to pop up the okay, hand. Hello. <laughs> the Hello. That's you right there. How's it going? I can hear you. Yeah, hi. How are you? My name is Rob Mueller. What's going on? Hi, I'm a senior technologist. Here. Nice sure. to see you. Hi, I don't. I couldn't. I couldn't hear. Uh, I just got the the headphones. So I, I, if you asked a question, I'm I, I wasn't able to to hear it. So could you repeat your question or statement that you had had mentioned? I was just introducing myself. Oh, okay. Rob Mueller, I'm a senior technologist in the Swamp Works. Uh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Uh, I've been to Swamp Works before. Uh, Jack Fox had given uh, a tour for us, and it was a very impressive facility. I'm really, really, uh, it's it's really exciting to see all the technologies that you're developing over there that uh, will be used for for lunar exploration and hopefully uh, for other interplanetary missions. Um, so and I and I again thank you for for providing us with that tour and meeting all the, the scientists over there. Uh, so it's very nice to meet everyone. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we're we're doing some great work here, and uh, we'd we'd like to collaborate with uh, private space industry, universities, other government agencies. So. Our philosophy is to collaborate as much as possible. So I'm happy that you're trying this out because this is the first time we've done a Google Hangout, but we might be able to use this in the future as a tool for collaboration. Excellent, excellent. Um, do you mind explaining uh, exactly what you're 
you're working on over there at Swamp Works? Okay, uh, my job is leading the Human Robotic Systems Project, mm -hmm. and that's uh, robots that interact with humans. So the solution is not robots, and the solution is not humans. The solution is humans working with robots. And today, what we do, you go to a car factory, what we do today is we put a robot up, and we put a big fence around the robot, and then we tell the humans, thou shalt not enter the workspace. <laughs> right? That's what we do. But that's old school. That's 1970s, 1980s robots. The, the new thing in robotics is called co-robotics. Co-robotics is cooperative robotics, so it's short for cooperative robotics. Co-robotics means I can work in a car factory and the robot is right next to me and I'm never afraid that that robot arm is going to kill me. And that means we have to have robots with more sensors on them and more intelligence. So the robot arm has a smart skin on it and it has intelligence so that the human will never be afraid of working in collaboration, in cooperation with the robot. So in space we have the same analogy where we have the astronaut, and then imagine the astronauts going on a, on a traverse, which means a, a hike. And then during that traverse, he has to carry 500 pounds of equipment. Well, even though you're in a reduced gravity environment, wouldn't it be great if you had a little robot mule, and the robot mule walked behind you? With all that would equipment? be great. <laughs> that's, that's what we mean by co-robotics. It's a robot that works with the human. Think of the robot as being your personal servant. And that's the kind of thing we're working on in this lab. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for, for explaining what the core robotics means and from your perspective and what you're doing over there. Um, are there any other technologies that you, you're willing to share with us that is currently under development at Swampworks that could be uh, used for, for lunar exploration, maybe uh, for uh, in situ resource utilization? Right. Uh, let, me, let me talk about Razor real quick. So uh, Razor is a mining robot. If you Google Razor, if you do a search on Razor, we have a bunch of videos out there and pictures. Mm -hmm. It's a new design that we have for small machines that can dig in extremely low gravity environments, possibly even asteroids. So the first step of IS for you is you have to acquire the resources. Well, there's two resources in space that are obvious. One is regolith, one is energy. And energy is the sunlight. And the regolith contains almost every element we need is in the regolith. The trick is, the catch, is that we have to extract the elements from the regolith and make something out of them for them to be useful. For so the general public, can you mention what those elements are so they under so they better understand exactly what, what can we find in the regolith? Yeah. In, in the lunar regolith, 42% of the lunar regolith is oxygen. So it also just so happens that when a rocket launches from Earth, 90% of the mass of that rocket is propellants. Mm -hmm. So what you're really doing is only two to three percent of that rocket, just the very little tip, the tip of that rocket, that's payload. The rest is just equipment, the transportation equipment. So now when you're on the moon, if, if you could make the propellants on the moon, that rocket would be much, much smaller <clears throat> or you could take more payload. So think about saving 90% of the mass of the rocket just by living off the land, making it locally. So the obvious thing is propellants. And the only reason we say that is because 90% of a rocket is propellants. So that's uh, the low-hanging fruit is what we call that. And so the next thing would be the metals. There are metals in the regolith. There's aluminum, there's iron, there's magnesium, and uh, th there's other smaller trace amounts of, of metal like titanium, and so these are all very useful aerospace materials. So if we can extract the metals from the regolith and take the oxygen out at the same time as we take out the metals, if we do all that with something called molten regolith electrolysis, so you know what lava is, right? Imagine taking lava and putting two electrodes in it, and then when you put a current across a, a, a potential of voltage across those electrodes, then you get a separation of the uh, metals and the oxygen. And so we can extract oxygen from the regolith, we can extract metals from the regolith, and then now the latest thing that everybody's debating is, is water, water, ice on the moon. Well, that was the missing piece. The missing piece was hydrogen. Hydrogen and carbon were the two missing pieces. But now with the L-Cross mission, we have shown that potentially there is water, H2O, and carbon monoxide, CO. 
we both we had traces of those elements appear in the plume of the impact from the LCROSS mission. So now we're really excited because now we have all the elements we need to create a self-sustaining civilization in outer space. If you went on a camping trip and you had to take everything with you, how long would that camping trip be? Not very long. But if you take a bucket with you and you grow, maybe you grow some food or you buy some food at a local store, now you don't have to take everything with you. And that's called living off the land. The technical term is in situ resource utilization. But that's the whole goal of our lab here is to make those technologies possible so you can just go live in space and cut the ties to Mother Earth. If we don't cut the ties to Mother Earth, it's going to be a very short trip. Excellent. Thank you for that explanation. So, so could you say that um, our first stepping stone for living in space is, I mean, it's, it makes sense to, to use as a test bed or our initial platform to, to live in a harsh environment, uh, to be first go to the moon, and then hopefully potentially one day also go live and establish uh, a colony in Mars maybe? Um, is, that, is that something that you, you'd say we're gearing so, towards no, we're, or we're getting not prepared? Going to, we're not going to say we have the answer. All I'm going to say is follow the resources. Because if you follow the resources, you will prosper and thrive. But we don't know where the resources are yet because we haven't prospected for the resources. So it's hard for me to give you a destination because maybe there's an asteroid that's just all water. You know, like uh, this uh, series is, is a protoplanet in the asteroid belt. Uh, next year, the New Dawn mission will be going there. You'll hear about it in 2000 and. Uh, 14 or, or maybe early 15, but you'll hear about this mission that's going to Ceres, and Ceres, they think that there's uh, more water ice on Ceres than there is fresh water on Earth. So think about that. If we had a big ball of ice out there in the asteroid belt and we use that for propellant, that's our gas station. And now if we have a gas station in the inner solar system, that gives us propellant for going to the outer solar system. So it's a stepping stone approach. But we have to follow the resources. That's the, the key to all of this. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so now that you know that you well that we need to figure out where those resources are, um, what kind of instruments are going to be needed to detect uh, where those resources are on the lunar surface? Yeah, you're going to have to get a camera. No, Jack's got one right there. Okay. Okay, Rob's going to uh, show you a instrument for getting into the ice on the moon in a second. He's going to go over where Jack is standing. Okay. In just a second. And he's getting uh, another technology to show you, too. Oh, there is Tim. Uh, as of right now, there's somebody um, that's uh, within the, the hangout uh, named Todd Loki. He has one question. He, he's asking, what about resources with economic value? Okay, can you still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, if I can elaborate really quick, I was just curious because he said follow the resources, but sometimes what could drive this is an economic value in understanding what resources would be on those destinations that might help fund this incredible like venture that has a large price tag, as we all know. Okay, so I spent a lot of time thinking about this, about the economics of space. And before I answer the question directly, I want to give an analogy. So there was a time where people thought that California had no economically valuable resources. And so it, there were several hundred years, like about 300, 350 years, when the European settlers really didn't see much economic use for California. It was a hard journey to get there, and the, uh, the natives in California were surviving on acorns as their primary staple food. The, uh, the Spanish missions were trying to introduce farming as a way of life, and there were some Westerners who came to graze sheep. Uh, then there was a gold rush, okay? So they found a resource that was immediately economically valuable despite the transportation costs, and within a decade, within a couple of decades, so many people moved into California that now it no longer matters that the gold is all gone. There is no 
basis in the California economy derived from gold as an industry anymore. And all the people that live there, let's take Silicon Valley for example, millions of people live there. There's, there are not enough resources in that area to support those people. But simply by being there, by doing industry, they create the value. And so there comes a point where you no longer rely on the, the resources for a region for people to, to be doing industry uh, economically. So the, the issue in space is how do we get it over that hump? And some people have said, well, maybe platinum is the gold of space. I think that data and energy are the resources that make the most sense for starters. So we can beam energy down from comm satellites. Well, one way to, to put industry in space to support communication satellites is to have a space tug that will boost the satellites from low Earth orbit to geosynchronous orbit. And then you have mining on the moon or asteroids to produce the propellant to operate the space tug. And there was a study done. Rob led the study, in fact, at International Space University last summer showing that you could pay back the, the cost of starting up that industry within 10 or 15 years and then make a huge profit and establish mining and establish a logistics network in space. So I think that's the way to go. Platinum may also play a role in it or other platinum group metals. There may be other magic resources. Helium-3 on the moon, people talk about that a lot. Then the detractors say, well, but there's no fusion. Why do you need helium-3? Well, the main reason we want helium-3 is actually for medical instruments. And there's a dwindling supply and a great demand. So maybe there will be some magic resources like that. I think ultimately it's about getting a sufficient industry base in space so that resources are not the primary question anymore. Hey, Phil, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. I, I've got some... Show and tell items here. Uh, first of all, this is the nano drill. It's the world's smallest percussive drill, and it's very light. And it can take a core sample with this drill bit right here. And so this is how you prospect for resources on another planetary surface. You take this nano drill, you put it on that vehicle that I'm pointing to in the back. That's a free flyer. It's a small spacecraft. Sometimes we call it a marsupial spacecraft because it's a robot sitting on top of a robot, like a kangaroo. And so <laughs> have a nano drill or another sample capture device, and we mount it on this spacecraft, on the leg of the spacecraft, and then that flies into the dark, cold craters and grabs a sample and brings it back to the mothership. The mothership is a lander with an instrument on it. The instrument measures the properties of that sample and then this little free flyer goes off and captures another sample. And then as we collect the samples and analyze the data, we build up a map and then the geologists go look at the map of what the properties of each sample are and they connect the dots. And when you connect the dots, you can build a picture, a geological map of what area uh, resources are in that place where you did all the sampling. And so that's the goal is to do the prospecting. Once you've done the prospecting, then you can go mine the resources. But to mine the resources, first you have to do some drilling and sample capture and characterize the resources. So I don't know if you watch this television show called Gold Rush, but it's one of my favorite shows. and. You know, the first thing you learn from that show is if you don't drill and you just start digging for gold blindly, the odds of finding gold are very, very low. But if you drill and you look for the gold before you go dig for the gold, then suddenly your your chances of having a successful business rise about a thousand percent. So the, the trick to resource utilization is to find the resources. First you follow the resources, but before you can follow the resources you have to find the resources. So we're building equipment in this lab to go find the resources because we're not at the point yet of processing the resources. Once we find the resources, we mine the resources. Once we mine the resources, we uh, refine the resources or process the resources. The next step is to use the resources. So Ruben, if you want 
I could show you one more thing. I moved the camera, and okay. right behind me, this is a unit that we took to Hawaii up onto a volcano, and it uh, is designed to move soil in and out of a chemical processing unit. So um, and I'm going to turn the camera around and show you Dr. Jim Marvani. And uh, Jim, you want to wave at us? Right, there we are. Hi, Jim. There's <laughs> Dr. Jim Monavani. So Jim was involved in uh, working on technologies to move soil in and out of chemical processors in low gravity environments. Right now, uh, Jim is working on predicting rocket blast effects for landing on the moon so that we can prevent hardware from being sandblasted when you land near your uh, prospecting hardware or your resource processing hardware. Excellent. Very good. So, um, what are your recommend? I know that uh, a while back there were recommendations from NASA uh, in regards to landing near uh, the Apollo Heritage sites um, and regarding the blast effects of, of, of any type of lander uh, coming here and what those the, the, the plume effects would be specifically uh, in regards to that. Uh, do you have any further insight? Uh, as well, now that that's kind of linked with, with what you had mentioned. So, yeah, that was an effort that we did for a couple of years. Um, that effort grew out of some research that we were doing here in this lab where we realized that the sandblasting effect was worse than we had previously thought. And so we asked headquarters to put together a team, and they, they got Rob Kelso, uh, who is now working with Pisces out in Hawaii. Uh, he was at the Johnson Space Center. Rob Kelso led the team, and I wrote a portion of that document, the portion related to the blast effects of landing on the moon. And uh, it's, a, it's a document that provides voluntary guidelines so that we can all work together to help preserve the Apollo sites. The, the lawyers are looking into whether there can be something more binding than voluntary guidelines. Everybody agrees we do own the hardware, but we don't own the moon that it's sitting on. <laughs> and we want to protect the hardware without getting into any legalities about, well, who owns the moon? So uh, for now, they're voluntary guidelines. And I think that's adequate for now because everybody that I know who's in the space industry, including yourselves at Earthrise Space, Everybody is very idealistic, and everybody wants to do the right thing, and nobody wants to be the people that damaged the Apollo sites. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would really be bad. So, um, yeah, nobody wants to do that. Right, it would um, be bad press. So um, people were coming to me asking me to give them guidelines, and so we finally got uh, got the effort together, and we did it, and that's what that document is. Uh, so the guidelines say land, uh, I think, two kilometers away and then drive the remaining distance. Or if you want to fly over within the two kilometers, you have to stay above a certain altitude so that you don't blow dust around and sandblast everything. And there are some other, some other guidelines about if you're driving inside and around the Apollo sites, how close you can get, how fast you can drive so you don't fling dirt, so that you don't accidentally crash into something, something that's very precious. Well, yeah, that makes yeah. That's and and those guidelines are, are very, and I've I've read over those guidelines and and they they do make a lot of sense and we do want to be able to preserve that. Um, not too long ago, I believe it was on the news that oh, that's the doorbell here. Um, there was uh, I think uh, Congress was trying to have the Apollo landing sites become um, uh, national parks. Um, I believe I believe that's what was on the news. Um, two what, senators. Yeah, two senators. Uh, I, I believe I mentioned that. What are your What are your thoughts on that? Well, I really don't want to comment on <laughs> laws that are under discussion. Okay. Since I fair. work in the executive branch of the government, um, I I will say that I I think uh, everybody's in agreement that we want to preserve the Apollo sites. And so uh, I think that's the emphasis, and I don't want to speculate any beyond that. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you. 
Um, let's see. I had another question in regards to, to resources in the regolith. Um, I think before there were some studies, or I, I think I might have seen on Discovery Channel, something about using the regolith ex itself to shield uh, astronaut habitats that would eventually be built on the lunar surface to, to help uh, with the radiation effects so, it, so that doesn't uh, affect the astronauts themselves while they're living in their habitats. Uh, do you, can you um, elaborate on that if you have any knowledge in regards to that particular item? Sure. So um, the problem with trying to use regolith as a radiation shield is that it contains a lot of high Z elements. So what, I, what we mean by that is they have uh, nuclei with a lot of protons and neutrons, like iron, for example. And cosmic radiation uh, striking a high Z nucleus causes it to shatter and then it throws out lots of particles that are at lower energy and much more numerous and that's bad on both counts because the slower the particle is the more dose it gives your body as it passes through and of course if there are more of them then it causes more dose so having a, a thin amount of regolith like a half a meter of regolith actually makes the radiation worse for everybody inside the, the uh, habitat. So everybody believes that you need uh, quite a bit of thickness of regolith to stop radiation. So I've heard numbers like one meter, I've heard three meters of re regolith, um, but it's got to be enough regolith to not only stop the primary radiation but also all the secondary radiation. Uh, a better radiation shield would be water. And like you know, uh, there is water on the moon, at the ice. Uh, water is a good shield because it has so much hydrogen in it. Hydrogen is low Z. It has a, the Z value is one. It has one proton and um, no neutrons. So the nuclei cannot shatter and so it, it stops uh, the radiation like rolling a bowling ball into a giant pile of ping pong balls. Um, the bowling ball will stop inside the ping pong balls instead of just knocking loose bowling balls out, other bowling balls out the other side of the pile. It just goes into the ping pong balls and stops. So that's a very bad analogy, but um, anyways, water is a better radiation shield, and so we think we could make, make it a bladder that holds water to put around the habitat, and that would be a, a more ideal solution. Or maybe use some combination of regular fan water. Oh, excellent. Oh, here. Know. I think there's a, there's a question from, from Danny. Here, come on. You can ask me the question. Sorry. Hey. So rather than uh, shielding our habitats with a ton of regolith, which is like three meters, that's a lot, uh, could we put it in one of the permanently shadowed, shadowed craters of the moon to protect from the sun's radiation near the poles? Um, no, because the radiation that we're worried about most is cosmic radiation, galactic mm -hmm. cosmic radiation. And that comes pretty much from all directions in space. So uh, the solar wind, the uh, radiation from most solar flares, and even from coronal mass ejections is not nearly as bad as the galactic cosmic radiation. Really? Huh. Yeah. Now, there are some extremely high-energy solar flares. They're rather rare, but once every few decades they happen. And um, that, that would be more directional. But uh, galactic cosmic radiation is there all the time, and that's the one that we have to worry about the most. OK. Um, uh, just, just real quick, it looks like Jack Fox is, is right next to a 3D printer. <laughs> Uh, could could you ex explain to us why you have a 3D printer in the lab there, and, and what are you printing? I can't. We can't hear you. Okay, am I un unmuted? Yeah, yeah you're okay. unmuted now. We can we can hear you. Well, I'm not sure who hit the print button, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah, we're uh, we have a in our incubator area. We have uh, three printers, and this is, and uh, we have three maker bots that we use uh, quite frequently to make cheap parts 
as well as it's a great way to visualize uh, something that we have a recent example that we proposed a project to management and uh, made a quick little prototype that you could pass around the room. Uh, it was actually a Mars rover wheel with some sensors on it. Yeah, yeah. We have, so, uh, we have any of those little... We do it for visualizations and actual parts. Yeah. We, we've, we've got a, our own printer right, right over there. <laughs> They're handy. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It is definitely something that a lot of new space <laughs> companies are using, including yourself. It's it's good to see that. Um, I'm sorry, I'm jumping from both from computer to computer, but uh, I guess this is the it's terrible the, feedback otherwise. Yeah, the, the microphone that works the best. Um, and that's great. And you said you mentioned something about incubator. So so could you explain? Are are there's is there space available there for? For uh, students or, or smaller companies to to come and work with you in, in parallel and make use of, of some of the infrastructure that you have there, um, it, how, how does that work? Uh, just so that uh, the public understands exactly what uh, if the, if that's even possible, if or if that's something that you're starting to explore right now. Well, we uh, the Swamp Works opened up late January, and. Uh, we benchmarked uh, innovation labs, and we have an innovation room upstairs, and then down here, I'm showing you our incubator area, and it's it's where right projects come and go, and the idea was uh, we we reserve we have people reserve the space, and you just can't camp out here forever. You come in and do your project and leave, and you have access to people and equipment. And this is this is our first area, and we have another area upstairs that we would like to develop. <laughs> there's a. But people yeah, seem happy um, there. They're, 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 <laughs> he was a little shocked there, but <laughs> yeah, our our desire is to have academia and industry. Uh, we work. We try to work through the contractual arrangements, and they uh, work projects with us here. Oh, excellent. Uh, well, I have a question here from Phil. Uh, Phil said, can you tell us about what Earthrise Space is doing? I, I can definitely do that. Uh, when, uh, earlier when I had mentioned, uh, when I introduced myself, uh, I'm just going to briefly uh, mention what uh, Earthrise Space is doing. Well, we're here we're dedicated to provide students with hands-on experience building spacecraft, and particularly uh, spacecraft that are built to send payloads to the lunar surface. Uh, and the payloads can can range from uh, scientific instruments. Um, it could be uh, small rovers. It could be instruments that look for resources on the lunar surface, and 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 there's multiple uses and. And this is what we're trying to uh, accomplish here: uh, is is prepare ourselves right now for the first lunar mission, which is scheduled for the second quarter of 2015 at the moment. Um, and that's also part of a competition that we're involved with, which is the Google Lunar X Prize, which is an international competition to land a, a rover on the moon and have it travel 500 meters, send a HD video back, uh, email a text message. And Panoramic views of the lunar surface, um, and and for the first team to accomplish that, um, there's a, a grand prize. Of course, there's a grand prize of twenty million dollars, and there's other uh, bonus prizes that that can be pursued by the teams as well. Uh, and some of those bonus prizes involve uh, water detection, uh, getting near one of the Apollo Heritage sites, which which is probably one of my most uh, pursued or, or I could say is 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 the the particular part of the mission that I'm most interested in because I'm curious to also see uh, what has happened to the Apollo Heritage sites. What 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 is what do they what does the spacecraft look like at this time? Is it has uh, has the color of the flag been uh, changed due to time? We don't know that yet, and I, I believe that's a that's something that a lot of people would be interested in, in learning about because that hardware has been there for for a long period of time now. Um, so again, just to summarize, uh, Earthrise Space is, is 
establishing a recurring lunar payload delivery service, and and in parallel, we're we're actually involving students and and having them build some of these components in order for them to gain experience and and become the new workforce for for the industry. So I hope that answers your question, Phil. Sorry. Oh, there. I think Jan. Here we go. Uh, Jan Edwards has a another question in regards to that. Uh, what does that mean for us economically in Florida when we win? Um, well, we are we are the Florida. You could say we are the Florida team as part of the Google Learner X Prize. Um, and we, we want to uh, make sure and establish that Florida is, is one of the main key states that is involved within the space industry. And, and we want to be able to have the engineers that have been part of that industry here uh, mentoring students and, and preparing the new workforce um, in order to tackle what's coming ahead uh, within the space industry in Florida. and which would, in the end, create more jobs and, and creation of new technologies. Um, so it's, it's, rather, it's very important for, for us to make uh, a stand or, or establish, the, the true, establish the significance of being involved within the space industry. Jonathan Soto, what is more beneficial, mining on the moon or mining on a meteor? Just curious. I would think a meteor because you never know what you get. I wonder where is the aim of the two? Okay, that's a very good question, Jonathan. Um, asteroids are, I mean, there's the meteor belt, right? That's that's a little bit further than the moon. Um, there's other companies right now that have uh, that are part of the new space industry that have started um, and a couple of those companies are the Planetary Resources and Deep Space Industries. They, they plan on mining uh, these meteors. And, and of course, there's been a few that have been prospected uh, already that are worth in, in the trillions of dollars. But you could just, just if you could think about that, well, it's, it's, it's going to take some time. Uh, I don't know if, for those of you that have played uh, a video game called StarCraft, you probably have to go and send a ship, bring back a little piece, go back and forth, back and forth, and that would take some time. Uh, um, that, that's just my take on it. But the moon also has, uh, of course, uh, certain resources that we could mine, as mentioned before. Um, why do you think there's craters on the moon? Um, obviously, there's been several meteors that have crashed there, and some of those, <laughs> and those meteors have... Um, could have a lot of precious metals in them. So, so that's uh, my my take on it. I, I I'm not sh which one's more. Uh, I guess which one is more beneficial. I think, but I mean, there's it depends on the ease of mining either or. So let me jump in and give you uh, a little input on it too. Um, first of all, let me uh, correct the terminology. A meteor is a rock that's coming in through the atmosphere, burning up. When it's still in space, it's either an asteroid or a meteoroid. <laughs> if it's bigger than a meter, it's an asteroid. Smaller than a meter is a meteoroid. That definition was just changed a few years ago. It used to be 10 meters where they drew the line between asteroid and meteoroid. So um, right now, with the new definition, nobody's really interested in meteoroids anymore. <laughs> We're interested in what used to be meteoroids, but they're now asteroids. Uh, so Perfect. we're talking. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I am glad that companies are trying it both ways. We will find out which works best. I think there are benefits to being on the moon. There are certain industrial processes that require gravity. If you want to refine metals, it's really going to be hard to do it without gravity. So you would have to have a rotating spacecraft to create artificial gravity. So you can handle it. Um, but there are just benefits to having gravity. And also there's uh, the benefit that the moon is always right there. You don't have to go out and bring it back to Earth. Uh, on the other hand, as Ruben said, there are, uh, there are a lot of asteroids out there that have metals. 
and you could go out and bring some back that are M class, that are pure astro, uh, pure metal. Actually, though, the I think it's the stony A chondrite meteoroids have the highest platinum group metals, even though they're not pure metal. The platinum group is a, at higher concentration in the stony A chondrus, and also um, carbonaceous A chondrites, I think, are um, good are considered the best for mining because they have not just metal but they also have carbon compounds and they have a lot of hydrated minerals that you can turn into water so everything that you want just about is in one type of asteroid there um, the, the problem there is you gotta bring it back and then you have to do all your work in zero gravity so I'm glad companies are doing it both ways. We're going to find out what works best. I think the ultimate goal is to bootstrap industry in cislunar space using the moon and or asteroids, hopefully and, and then after you've bootstrapped it, got it working, then the real goal is to move beyond the inner solar system. The asteroid belt has billions of times more of all the resources that we have on Earth, and Mars is out there closer to the asteroid belt, and um, if you want to go to other stars, you've really got to harvest the whole solar system. You've got to leverage our entire solar system before we have an industry capable of becoming a space fair, a interstellar faring civilization. So that's the goal: is eventually move towards the asteroid belt, but the bootstrapping has to happen in cislunar space. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Phil. Um, there is another question here. Uh, have you worked with planetary resources or deep space industries at Swampworks? Have they yeah. visited? Have, have they at least visited? Let's it's class five. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, I'll let Jack answer that one. Okay. Yeah, we've had conversations with both, and they have a lot of needs for technology, and uh, there's a lot of work needs to be done. Kind of that process for mining, first you have to characterize what's out there. So kind of the first decade is you got a remote sense what's out there and maybe that's through kind of cube CubeSat type technology with sensors and uh, right now there's there's really no there's no bus to get the cubes out there and so we we have had interesting conversations and uh, we we plan to have more before we kind of figure out what to do first, second, and third. Excellent, thank you. Oh, we got a cheat sheet here of questions, I guess. Hold on, <laughs> I'll put Daniel back. Leave that last all these. Specifically, how uh, why does NASA partner with private entities, or how? Here. You can answer. Hello again. So how exactly do you, uh, does NASA go about partnering with private entities? Did, did you get that? Yeah, that's another good question for Jack. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All over that way. All right. Well, okay. We're the federal government, and there's uh, formal processes mm. called Space Act agreements, which are partnering yeah. arrangements. The government's trying to get more uh, efficient at that, and so we're pushing the envelope on just just documenting through um, memorandums of understanding, uh, just just to have some kind of uh, verbal agreement on, on uh, conversations, initial conversations, and then when you get more formal about knowing exactly what you want to do, then okay, go with a, a space act agreement. And in our lab, we're uh, we're willing to take phone calls and just have conversations like this this uh, this uh, little uh, chat session here, just uh, without documenting everything. So so that that that's where we're at. We're trying to be uh, be the new NASA and be more uh, business friendly. Yeah. Um. Excellent. Does anyone else have any questions? Anyone in the chat boxes?
Um, I think that's a wrap. Then. All right. Um, I don't know if no one's got any more questions. Actually, I was kind of, I was kind of wondering, um, when if once you get the resources on the surface of the moon and process them, how would you get them into orbit to to be used by a spacecraft? How we, you mean from the lunar surface up into yeah. orbit? Yeah. Okay. Well, well, if you're creating propellants on the moon using the ice on the moon, then the uh, and if you're using reusable spacecraft, then presumably the launch costs off the moon would be fairly low. So you would just, uh, the straightforward method is you just have a, a, a taxi service. You, you use spacecraft and you launch it off the moon, and then you bring the taxi back down to the surface again. People have also looked at other methods using rail guns, um, or yeah. they call them mass drivers in this context. It would be a big electromagnetic gun that just shoots cans of rocket or cans of ice at the moon. Uh, there was a movie recently. That Island style. Helium mining on the moon, and they were using a rail gun to shoot all the canisters of helium all the way back to the Earth. So uh, that would be another possibility yeah. to do it like that. Well, that that's, uh, sounds pretty far in the future right now. Um, all right. If no one else has any questions, I know you guys are busy. Uh, I'll let you get back to your work. Okay, it was great hanging out with you. Are we all good? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank well, definitely. You. We uh, really thank you guys for doing this. We hope we can do more stuff like this in the future. And uh, we look forward to contacting you again. Mm -hmm.